Welcome back to the Data Professor YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Sunin Nanta Senamad, and I'm an Associate Professor of Bioinformatics. On this YouTube channel, we cover about data science concepts and practical tutorials. So if you're into this type of content, please consider subscribing. So in this video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the field of bioinformatics. Because in the first part, I talked about how to collect the data. But then you might be confused as to what is the data all about. And so we're going to take a step back to look at the big picture about what is bioinformatics and a brief look of what is biology. And for those of you who are not biology major, this video is for you. And for those of you who are computer science major, then you want to stick to the end of the video where I will share some of the tips and tricks of what I use in developing bioinformatics tools, which are the exact same methodology which I use in my own research group. And so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, and so if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel for the subsequent part of this bioinformatics project series. Okay, so before beginning, let's have a look at this wonderful quote that I really like from Florian Markowitz. In all biology is computational biology. So in this article that Florian wrote, he mentioned that all biology is really computational biology. And so this is very eloquently put. And so he says that I will argue that computational thinking and computational methods are so central to the quest of understanding life that today all biology is computational biology. And so this is particularly true given that the field of biology and medicine is very data intensive, meaning that the life sciences, which is the collective name for biology, chemistry, and all of the natural sciences, also medicine. So they're all housed in the field called life science. And so life science is very data intensive, meaning that they generate high throughput data because of the advancement in the science and technology which give rise to high throughput equipment where robotics, automation, computer software, programming are used to generate high volume of data and which is coupled with the lowered cost of storage. And so when high volume of data are generated from these biological outputs, from experiment, from measurement, and so all of these information are stored in big data lakes. And so we researchers at the time, they might not know what to do with all of these big data in biology. And so the natural step is to just store it and figure out later how to make use of that data. Okay, so that might be the thinking before, but with the advancement in the field of bioinformatics, computational biology, there is a paradigm shift towards data intensive biology, where we use data to drive biological insights. And I read somewhere that Carl Linnaeus, who is a Swedish botanist, if he was to live today, he would probably be a computational biologist. And so he is the father of modern taxonomy, whereby organisms, animals, plants are classified into various kingdoms, genus, species, etc. Okay, and so let's proceed to the next slide. Quest for understanding about life. So humankind are in a constant effort to understand the world around us. So humans have always been curious. And so this had led them to perform worldwide expedition by Christopher Columbus, Americo Vespucci, Magellan, which facilitated the discovery of previously unknown parts of the world. And in modern times, the search of extraterrestrial life, as well as understanding of our planet and galaxy, led to the development of strong satellites and space expedition to outer space, which have been created and launched. And in the field of life sciences, as I have already mentioned, the generation of this big data is called omics data. And so the omics data allow us to further understand the molecular basis of life and how we can treat diseases. And so before we proceed further, let's start with a general terminology. What is biology? Well, biology is the study of life and living organism. And the term biology originates from the Greek words bios, which means life, and logia, which means study. And the field essentially studies the biological processes sustaining life. This is a very classical biology book, Campbell Biology. 
which kind of brings back memory of first year of college. And so the following bullets are extracted from the table of contents from this book. And so I rearranged the ordering of some of the bullet points to start from the macro level and into the micro level. So at the big picture, we have the ecology and the ecosystem, right? So it's the habitat where living organisms are thriving either symbiotically or not. And so ecology deals with the population of different organisms. And then if we move on to the next bullet point, we look at the individual organism. And the individual organism has several levels of organization, right? So a human being is comprised of organs. And organs are made up of tissues. And tissues are made up of cells. And cells are made up of organelles, nucleus, and the nucleus and organelles contains the DNA and proteins, and the proteins are made up of amino acids. Amino acids are made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of electrons, neutrons, and protons. Okay, and then to the next bullet point is evolution, biological diversity, because over the span of time, living organisms will evolve by adapting to their own environment. And so so essentially evolution could be either convergence or divergence meaning that if two organisms live in the same environment but they are different at first and so they could co-evolve and then converge on the other hand two organisms could be coming from the same genus or species but then they lived in different environment and so they could diverge right because each of this when placed in different environment they will have to adapt to that environment right and so if we look at it at the bio biological level, at the molecular level, their biochemical pathway might have been adapted to fit in with the environment that they are living in. And so they are diverging in terms of evolution. Okay. And the book also covers about microorganisms, vertebrates and invertebrates, right? Having or not having backbones, right? Vertebrates, invertebrates. And the microbes or microorganisms are the tiny organisms that we need microscope to see. And they could be pathogenic, meaning that they cause disease, they could be viruses, or they could be probiotics, such as the ones found in yogurt, and so they are in the gut as well. And if we look at the animals and plant structure, growth, and development, and so it's the various structural component of animals, as well as their growth and development. And if we zoom in at the molecular level, we look at their cellular structure, looking at the molecular metabolism, looking at how the cell communicates. And then if we zoom in further, we're going to look at the central dogma and the genetic information. And so the central dogma just tells about the information flow from DNA to RNA to protein. And so essentially that's what biology entails. And if you would like to read further, I would recommend this Campbell biology book. Okay, so previously I talked about the omics, right? So what is the omics? So historically, omics started from the first omic, which is genomics. And so genomic entails information about the genes. And so there was this big project called the Human Genome Project, where, where initially scientists had big hopes for the project, meaning that it was thought that the completion of that project would bring about understanding of the basis of life. But then the completion of the Human Genome Project was just the beginning, was just scratching the surface of what genomics has to offer us in understanding about life. And so this led to other omics as well, such as the protein omics or the proteomic. So they are the information about proteins. And glycomic entails information about sugars. Lipidomics entails information about lipids. Metabolites or metabolomics. And the interaction between molecules are interactomics. Okay. And so all of these omics represent big data. And so there has never been a better time to learn data science and apply it to biology. And there is a lot of interesting data that you could play around with, that you could try to make sense. And so, and so one area that I'm involved in is drug design, drug discovery. And so the big data on interactomic is what I use for my research. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so I have already mentioned all of these points. So let's begin to the next slide. And so with omics, 
comes precision medicine. So omics will provide us the basis, right? It provides us with the information of patients, right? Conceptually, if you take patients' tissue samples, you could perform various types of omic analysis. And then such big data could then be used to design an antibody that is tailored made to the patient or to take the cells or the tissue samples from the patient and create such organoid, which would mimic the organ of the patient and then test an FDA approved drug to see whether the organoid would respond favorably or unfavorably to the drug. So this is outside in vitro and so not in the host or the human being or the patient but in the organoid right in the test tube. And the benefit of this precision medicine is it allows us to use the data generated from the patient and create tailor-made or customized medicine because each human being are 0.001% different in their genomic data. And so we can harness the big data coming from this omics derived from the patient in order to perform analysis and figure out the optimal medicine or optimal treatment plan or a customized drug or antibody that is tailor-made specifically to the patient. And so this field has immense utility. And so some of the challenges of this big data is that the omics data are often large and complex. And so this is particularly true for the next generation sequencing, which generates humongous size of data. And so the size is simply not feasible to download from the internet. But in order to perform such analysis, you will have to have someone send you the hard drive containing the genomic data, right? Because let's say that data is very big in the terabytes or petabyte order, then it's not feasible to use the internet to download that. So it's more convenient and more economical to just send in the hard drive by post. Okay, and so the curse of dimensionality owing to the large variables will render conventional statistical methods rather difficult to perform. And so we need to use machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to make sense of this big data. And so you might ask, what is bioinformatics? And so as mentioned in the previous slide, what was once seemed impossible and formidable is now possible by a field called bioinformatics. And so we could think of the field of bioinformatics as a field that applies statistics and information theory to make sense of big biological data. And so by information theory, this would encompass machine learning, databases, and other informatics approach. So bioinformatics allows us to harness the big data that are available in order to deduce and understand the molecular basis of how disease arises, particularly, for example, how mutated genes work and how do they get give rise to the downstream effect. An example would be to identify which gene is responsible for a disease and to compare the gene frequency of two cohort cohort meaning two population. So the population comprising of the people having the disease and those not having the disease. And so bioinformatics lies at the interface between biology and computer science. So we're essentially applying concepts from computer science to make sense of big data in biology. And so bioinformatics is especially important in this age of post-genomic era, where there are various omics, as I have mentioned, genome, proteome, metabolome, microbiome, metagenome, interactome. And so let's have a look at some of the common tasks in bioinformatics. So the first common task would be to search. And so by searching, I mean search public databases for information about the gene, protein, RNA, and the biochemical pathway. And so this comes in the form of databases like GenBank, Protein Data Bank, KEG Database, Uniprot, right, and services from the NCBI such as the BLAST, where you could have a query sequence, either the gene or the protein, and then you would BLAST. And so the BLAST will allow you to identify the identification of the unknown sequence. So what is the name of the gene or what is the name of the putative protein? 
based on the similarity search, which is essentially the sequence alignment, right? So this brings us to the second part is compare, right? Because we are able to compare the similarity between two sequences or more than two by means of performing sequence alignment. And so the third would be to construct models such as structural models of protein structure and also to build predictive model, particularly using machine learning in order to make sense of retrospective data. And finally, to integrate and curate. So this will take the most amount of time. It is essentially data collection and pre-processing. And so as they say, garbage in, garbage out. So the most important part of data science is high quality data. And so the integration and curation of data is very crucial and it's the pillar for the success of bioinformatics. Okay, so computational biology versus bioinformatics. So both terms might be used interchangeably. They are pretty synonymous. They're very similar. And so let's think of computational biology as the application of computational technique to understand biology. And let's think of bioinformatic as the development of algorithms and tools to analyze and solve biological data, right? So both are similar, right? So bioinformatic entails more of a technical term, meaning to apply algorithms and make tools to solve the biology data, but computational biology is simply taking an existing tool or software that a bioinformatician has developed and use that to solve biology problem. So what are bioinformatic tools? They are databases, softwares, web servers, and so they help us to analyze and gain insights from the biology data. And so the bioinformatics tool could be either commercially available where we have to pay to use it, or it could be freely available, either in the form of publicly free to use or free for access academic institutes. Okay, and so this is a breakdown of the commercial software versus the free bioinformatics software. And so in terms of the cost, features, support, and ease of use, right? So for commercial, you either pay a one-time fee or a rolling fee by subscription. Whereas if it is free, it could either be no cost, meaning you don't have to pay whether you're from industry or academia, or it could be free for academia, meaning that those from industry will have to pay. And so the feature Features for commercial software would be a bit more reliable because the company is paid to make progress, whereas free software or coming from open source project are relying on volunteers. And the volunteers are people who spend their free time to develop together as a community the features of the software. And so the time at which the features are released might not be as strict and periodic as the commercial company. But that is changing owing to the growing community base of some open source project. However, there's no guarantee because volunteers can come in or come out. And so that might affect the reliability or the dependency of the rolling of the features. And so if we think of in terms of the support, commercial company has dedicated staff to provide support, whereas the free project would have no dedicated support and rely on community support. So just people, users, who are helping one another. So let's think of Stack Overflow, okay? Community support. Ease of use. So commercial software are usually intuitive and have few bugs because they have to debug and test rigorously before they roll out the software. But free projects might have bugs and they might be more difficult to use. So this really depends on the popularity or the number of contributor to the open source project. Okay, and so you have to weigh in the pros and cons of the commercial and free. And sometimes I see that commercial software are essentially comprised of features coming from free software by weaving together in a seamless manner, meaning that the commercial software might just be a stitch of the features from free software, but made it into a uniform workflow that is easy to use and friendly to the non-coder or non-programmer. Okay, and so if you find value in this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you in the next one. But in the meantime, please check out these videos.